And tonight, Lord, we want to praise you. We want to worship you. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. For your word is alive, it's active, oh God. Father God, open our hearts to receive that that you have for us tonight. Father God, let us be like the Bereans who will go and search the scriptures to find what is of the truth and what is not. Father God, I thank you that the Holy Spirit is the ultimate teacher. And I, we welcome the Holy Spirit in this room tonight. And we say, Holy Spirit, you teach us tonight. Lead us into all truth. Let your will be done. Let your revelation come forth. Remove everything that is of us. And let your peace and your grace rest upon us tonight. Let your goodness and your love flow in this place. Father, I thank you for peace. I thank you for love. I thank you for grace. Your grace is flowing in this house. Your goodness is moving among us. And Father, I just want to thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Well, tonight James asked me to minister on God's judgment. And see, a lot of people have problems with that. And I really don't. Because anything that is of God, I don't fear. I fear nothing that is of God. Because whatever is of God has to benefit me. See, if I fear, then there's certain things I can receive from God, and then there's things I cannot receive from God because I'm afraid of the wholeness of God. See, y'all, we break God into segments. God is one complete God, and everything about him is complete. He's not a portion of this, a portion of that, and a portion of this, and then we make the whole. No, when I declare God is love, he's love. When I say God is mercy, he's mercy. He's not half love, half mercy, half grace, half judgment. No, he's complete in himself. See, see, a lot of times we like to treat God like man. And we break man into segments. This person is this way or that way. God says, I'm not this way. I'm not that way. I'm God. I am who I say I am. Will you believe that I am who I say I am? When we can embrace the fullness of God, then guess what? We're going to be able to see the true glory of God. The Bible says it like this. It says the children of Israel, I put it this way, they knew his hand. They knew what he could give, him, give them. But it said Moses knew his ways. Moses knew God. Moses knew the wholeness of God. And if you don't believe me, turn to your Bibles. Exodus 34, 5 through 7. Because before we talk about the judgment of God, we got to establish the very nature of God. A lot of times when we say, God, show me your glory, we're not really saying, God, show me who you are. We're saying, show me your power. But do y'all understand when David, when, 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 when Moses said, God, show me your glory, he wasn't asking to see God's power because he had already seen God's power. He saw God's power open the Red Sea. He saw God's uh, power bring plagues. He saw God's power strike down the Egyptians. What he was saying, he says, God, I see your power, but I want to know your nature. Teach me your ways, O oh God. This, this is how I said, teach me your ways, O oh God, now. Exodus 34, now. Why? He says, so that I may know you and continue to find favor in your Sight. See, when we know God, it don't make us, it doesn't distance us from God. It positions us to find more and more favor from God. I don't duck and hide from God. You know, I tell God, God deal with me as I am. God, keep it real with me. Just like I keep it real with my children. I say, God, keep it real with me. If you want to deal with me, God, deal with me. Because I'd rather you deal with me on this side of the grave than to deal with me on the other side of the grave. I'd rather you to come and, and, and begin to deal with things in my heart now than to wait when I stand before you and I say, God, how did I miss it? 
See, I had to reach a place in my life. I'm not afraid for God to deal with me. Why? Because my heart is, God, I want more of you. And to, know, to, to have more of you, that means I got to die to me. And I got to realize this stuff in me just don't line up with him. Now, there's doctrines in me that ain't got nothing to do with God. Something I've been taught, something I never researched, never look, looked in the word to see if it's there. But when we go to God's truth, we'll find out he is who he is. So Exodus 34, it says, Moses asked the Lord, he says, Lord, show me your glory. So in, in 33, so when we get to 34, God says, I'm going to show you my glory. Now watch what God did when he showed him his glory. And Jehovah came in a what? Cloud. Y'all, he had to come in a cloud now. Y'all know why he had to come in a cloud? Because he's so holy. He's so pure. He's so righteous. He had to hide himself. Because what he said, Moses, he said, Moses, no man can see my face and live. No man can behold the purity of my glory and stand. See, what God was establishing with Moses, he said, Moses, I'm a holy God. Y'all, God is a holy God. Y'all, he's a God of love. Now, I'm not going to deny that. But God is what? Holy. See, if we lose the holiness of God, then we lose the justice of God, and we lose the reverence for God, and we reduce God to the same level as man. Yeah, I'm a friend of God. I'm also a servant of God. He's my father. But he's my master. I can play the dual. We, we should better play the dual roles. So he says, and Jehovah came down in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of Jehovah. So the first thing he does, he proclaimed his what? Name. He tells us because in his name is his very nature. That's why G when Jesus said, whoever believes in my name, it don't just mean whoever believes in the name of Jesus. It says, my name entails all of who I am. So if you believe in my name, you believe in all that I say I am. When he says, I am the great I am, he's saying, I am whatever my name declares about me. That's why when you read throughout the Bible, that's many names for God. But in every name is something they saw in God and they declared it. Because when you see God as he is and you see his awesomeness and all of a sudden he reveals another part of himself to you. You go, wow. Man, I didn't know God this way. I thought I knew. So he declares his name. And guess what? The good news is he still declares his name to us. Every time you think you know God, all of a sudden he shows up and he removes the veil or the scales from your eyes and he shows you a different aspect of him. And you say, God, thank you. Now I know. I thought I knew, but now I truly what? No. Then he goes on to say, Jehovah, Jehovah God. Then he says, I'm merciful. I'm gracious. Long suffering. Abounding in goodness and truth. Keeping mercy to thousands, forgiving iniquities and transgressions and sin. And who and who will by no means clearly means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the sons, on the sons of the sons to the third and fourth generation. So he began to declare all this goodness. And he says, hold on now. Let me tell you something else, Moses. I don't let sin, sin escape either. My holiness won't, won't allow me to close my eyes to sin. See, if we understand that, we understand what, what Jesus really did on the cross. Do y'all, do we understand the judgment that Jesus took for us? Y'all, God was so holy that when the sins of the world came upon his son, he had to depart. When Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? He had never been separated from the Father, but because the Father is so holy, 
He could not look upon sin. And if he could not look upon sin on his son, how do we think he can still see sin and just close his eyes and say it's no big deal? Y'all, if we really understood the judgment that Jesus took, we'll be weeping. We'll be saying, God, thank you that it was him and not me. Y'all, I have to say that sometimes. Lord, thank you. It was Jesus that took the judgment and not me. Because I couldn't have paid that price. Y'all, nobody can pay the price he paid. Y'all, he paid a steep price. Nobody has had all the sins of the world to sit on you at one time. And you being pure and holy and righteous and your father leaves you. And the Bible says, and darkness covered the earth. See, that's how holy God is. And, and what Jesus is, re, what, what the scriptures is reminding us today is, even as believers in Christ, we still got to recognize the holiness of God because it's the holiness of God that brings the judgment of God. And y'all, guess what? The judgment can be good, and the judgment can be bad. His holiness, watch this, will cause him to judge in your favor. There's moments he will judge in your favor because he's holy. But it's a flip side of that coin. Because he's holy, there's moments that his righteousness and his holiness says, I can't take it anymore. See, see, we always talk about the New Testament and the Old Testament, the New Covenant and the Old Covenant. Do y'all know God was just as patient in the Old as he is in the New? Y'all, God wasn't mean. Y'all, come on. He might have destroyed them. But you know what? That's when, when his glory really draws near. See, that's why I said the church. I want your glory. God says, hold on. Do you really want it? Because the closer his glory draws the more we see his holiness. The more you see his holiness, the more accountable you become. See, that's why I got to share this message because I believe God is positioning us for his holiness. I believe God is positioning us to see his glory and to manifest his glory in the earth, but if we're not prepared and his glory show up, it can bring judgment on people. Because when, when his goodness draws close and we see him as he is, we can't remain the same. See, God is telling me, he says, OJ, open the eyes of my people and let them know. When I begin to draw close, when I show forth the trueness of my glory, y'all you know, think about it. The children of Israel saw God in a cloud by day and in a fire by what? night and that still didn't change their hearts what are you saying judgment don't change people's hearts it really doesn't see that's why I told my church I ain't here to create no fear in nobody because judgment don't change people's hearts if that's the case the children of Israel would all just they would have entered the rest and they would have been with God because what all they saw would you would think it would make you more righteousness all all judgment does is show forth the glory of God it says this is who I am I am holy but judgment don't draw people to the cross no, 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 it don't. You would think, oh, because of his judgment, more people going to get saved. So I ain't here to preach that kind of gospel because the children of Israel tell me that's just not true. It's, it's not true. But at the same time, it does not negate his holiness. <laughs> it don't change who he is. So let's turn to Isaiah 6 and 1. So God says, I'm holy. He says, I won't forget sin. Now we come into Isaiah, and Isaiah, all of a sudden, you know, we pray, God, let me see what Isaiah saw. And I know how to pray that prayer. <laughs> but you know what? I'm reading it from Isaiah in black and white. I'm, I wasn't there with Isaiah. And when you read this, don't read it as if it's, it's letters on a page. Picture yourself being there. See yourself where Isaiah was, and you'll get a different revelation about God. See, it, it's sweet words. Let's read it. It says, Isaiah 6, 1 through 7. 
It says, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And it's above it stood the seraphims. Each one had, what, six wings. With two wings, he covered his face. Y'all, that's how holy God is. The seraphims have no sin in them, but he's so holy that the seraphims have to what? Cover their face. Now we take lightly. These angels, these are majestic beings, and when they're in the, in the presence of God, they have to cover their face. And they don't stop there. The Bible says, and with the other two wings, they cover their feet. Because why? They realize they're in the presence of a holy God. And then it says, and with two wings, they flew. And then they begin to cry out, holy. And, and it says, this, and one cried to another. They begin to cry one to another, and they begin to declare, holy. 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 And we read that, but put yourself in Isaiah's place. And he heard them begin to cry out, holy, holy, holy. And all of a sudden a light went on and he says, he's a holy God. Oh, I didn't know this God. Yo, Isaiah was prophesying before he went into the temple. He did not start prophesying when he saw the glory of God. What is tell me the gifts can flow and you still might not know him. Well, he was already in the gifts. He was already prophesied from one through six. He had prophesied. Then all of a sudden King Uzziah died and he was grieving and he walked into the temple. And then all of a sudden he saw the glory of God and he heard the angels crying, holy, holy, holy. And I don't see Isaiah uh, uh, standing up in a comfort zone feeling good about himself. No, 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 baby. He, he wasn't feeling good at this point. Because when you stand in the presence of God, you stand in awe. Yo, you, you stand with reverence. Yo, I don't matter, listen, no matter how much we might knock the Muslims, they have more reverence for a false God. Amen. Listen to this. Than we have for a living God. Amen. They reverence somebody who's not God. Allah is not God. I don't mind saying it. Muhammad is not his prophet. I don't mind saying that. But they reverence what? Him. And then when it comes to us sometimes, we can let people say anything about God. I remember my wife used to always say, uh, 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 what's that word? Uh, M-O-G, M some G. O-M-G. I said, I said, baby, you need to stop saying some O-M-G. Come on, that is God you're talking about. You don't honor, we don't honor his name. Well, that's just a sin. No, 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 you don't understand. He's God. So when his name come out of my mouth, it can't just be for any reason. His name is sacred to me. And I got to watch how I said the world can use it any kind of way. But we as the body of Christ can't. Why? Because he's holy. And when I call him Elohim, Something should break on the inside of me. And I realize that I'm worshiping him who created the heavens and the earth. So the world can say OMG, but I can't say it. Why? Because when I say the name of my God, it means something to me. It breaks something in me. When he cries, holy, 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 Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord. And the first thing happened, he cried out, whoa. Y'all, come on. When you see God, you got to go, whoa. Mm -mm. It, you know, that's why it, I be watching stuff on TV. And I know people be lying now. Everybody who tell me they've been, been up in heaven and saw God. I, I know they be lying. See, I'm going to tell you why, Lori, because they be saying stuff. You know, I walked in, and I was just talking to God like he was my friend. But Isaiah the prophet now got up in the glory, too. And when he saw him, and he compared himself not to me, but to God, he cried, whoa. 
See, the church have lost a reverence and an awe of God that we no longer cry, whoa. When I'm in his presence, not fear, it's called honor and respect. I honor him, and when I see him as he is, I say, Father, I love you, whoa. See, when you get into that place, people don't have to tell you to stop sinning. No, 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 no. See, I told my church, I ain't, I ain't going to come up in the pulpit every Sunday and tell you to stop sinning. I ain't got that kind of time. I, I really don't. Because once I start, I got to keep it up, then you're going to get mad at me at some point and blame me. And say, the only reason I'm not doing this is because Pastor OJ said it. No, it's when you behold God. Your heart cries, Whoa. You don't get up and you spend, uh, uh, Peter said it like this, we shouldn't spend the rest of our lives struggling with sin. Why? Because when we see him as he is, and not just him, but even when we behold Jesus, the radiance of his glory, Jesus Christ is the radiance of the Father's glory. And in the Old Testament, I mean, when he walked the earth, he walked like a man. I was going to read, but I'm going to quote it anyway. And the Bible says, John, nah, nah, nah. John, he the only one said this, that he was the beloved disciple. Now, nobody else called him that, but John called himself that. He went on to say, and I laid on his bosom. And you know, we always talk about laying on God's bosom, right? How God just wants you to lay in his lap. And he does. I'm not saying that. See, don't get me wrong. God is a gentle father. But the Bible says in Revelation that when John saw him, in the fullness of his what? Glory. See, he knew him as teacher. He knew him as master. But in Revelation, he saw him as king. See, we, it, we can preach about the kingdom, but until we understand the king, it's the king. See, see, this is where judgment comes from, because when you understand a kingdom and how the kingdom works, you understand that in a kingdom, if there's no justice, the kingdom cannot stand. When John saw him in Revelation, he saw him as king. And the scripture says he fell like a dead man. And Jesus came and spoke to him and said, do not fear. Now, why did Jesus have to say not fear? That man was scared. The same one who laid on his book. All of a sudden, he realized, man, I didn't know him. I thought I did. But now I have beheld him. He's more than just a lamb who was slain. He was more than just a teacher who walked through Galilee. He was more, he's more than just he who washed our feet. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He's the great I am. He's the prince of peace. See, my brothers and sisters, when we know him that way, we, are, we stand before the world boldly. And we're not ashamed of our God. And we declare to the world who he is. But then you will say, OJ, now, I hear all that you're saying. Now, what does this have to do with judgment? Does this have anything to do with judgment? It has everything to do with judgment. Because when he show us who he is. Listen, I'm going to tell you why judgment comes. When people reject his love, his kindness, his goodness, his mercy, his long suffering, that's what brings the judgment. Can we keep it real? And don't start with the New Testament. Go back to the Old Testament. Man, them prophets cried out one after another, begging and pleading with them and saying, if you just turn your heart, if you just get it right with God, if you just will repent, if you will just do it his way, he won't judge you. See, let me tell you this. There's always a warning before the judgment. That's why I'm not here to pronounce everything God's judgment. Some happened in America. I'm not even here to say, well, that's God's judgment. Because according to the scriptures now, judgment first began with the household of God. 
So I'm not running around every little thing I see after the fact. Now, you know, we always prophesy after the fact. If it's really God's judgment, why you didn't prophesy before the fact? Now, I'm not saying 9-11 wasn't God's judgment. I don't know. I ain't been before him asked. He ain't told me that. All I asked the prophets, why won't you prophesy before time? Why won't you stand up and say, thus says the Lord, something going to hit New York this month because you all are in rebellion against me. Then you know what I would say, James? Now, that's God's judgment. Now, do God, I believe certain things have it's just warnings. He's warning us. He's trying to get our attention. He said, no, you don't really want the judgment now. No, 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 you, uh -uh, you don't want. Heed the warning. For the Christian, he says, heed the discipline. I discipline those I was. Love, you don't want my judgment. And I don't want to give you my word. God, Y'all, God is so kind. This is what he told uh, Abraham. He said, if you can find 10 people. In, so uh, in, in Sodom and, and Gomorrah, if you can sign just 10, I will not judge that place. So y'all, let's not say God's goodness just started under grace. That, that was under the law. That was even before the law. God's goodness has been here forever. His goodness is not based on man. It's based on who he is. And he says, I really don't want to judge Solomon and Gomorrah. Abraham, if you can find 10 people, just because you prayed, I was spared. Guess what? He couldn't find 10. Only found three. Found four. One just didn't make it out because she loved seeing so much. She looked back. She, look, she fell under the judgment because she loved seeing so much. She looked back. God had brought her out, but she couldn't let go that that was. She saw the fire falling and still looked back. Now, that, that goes to show us the conditions of people's what? Hearts. So, so we ask the question, well, will God judge in this day and age? I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Peter 4, uh, 4, 13 through 9. Listen what it says. 1 Peter 4, 13 through 9. It says, but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is what? Revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are what? Blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or evil doer or a meddler. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that what? Name. Listen, I'm going to tell you, people who suffer for, for being a Christian, it's not God's judgment. It's called persecution. That's what he's, that's what he's saying here. It's a difference between God's judgment. And persecution. And we got to make sure we understand the difference. Persecution means, Brit, I am suffering because of righteousness. I have stood up for Jesus and people hate me and they are coming against me. See, uh, Peter, before he goes into the, he land, he's laying out a truth here that we better grasp. See, if you are of the righteous, you don't have to fear God's judgment. That's why when people be telling uh, uh, I'm afraid to deal with the judgment, my whole thing is, if your heart is right with God, I didn't say if you're perfect. I said if your heart is what? Right with it. What is a right heart with God? A right heart with God is if the Holy Spirit comes and touch something in my life, I get it right. If you come and, and expose me, if you come and discipline me, I might not like your discipline, Lord, but I'm willing to receive it. See, when you got that kind of heart, you don't have to fear the judgment. You won't know why, because the judgment don't apply to you. Y'all, the judgment don't, do not apply to those who are in what? Christ. For there is no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ Jesus. And we put a period behind it. But as King James add a little something. The NIV, we, they leave the other part off. For those who walk by the spirit and not by the flesh. 
For the judgment comes on the things of the flesh, not the things of the spirit. Listen to what I'm about to say. If I'm walking by the spirit, there cannot be no judgment because the judgment cannot judge the things of the spirit. Because the things of the spirit is of God. But if I am born again and I'm living by the what? Flesh. And I've chosen to walk by the what? Flesh. Then the flesh always brings judgment. Now, the flesh always brings judgment. It did it in the old. It did it in the new. It brought the judgment of G uh, upon Jesus. And guess what? If I choose to live this way. Yeah, we are talking about lifestyles here. This is what Peter is talking about. He's not telling me you go out there and just commit a little act of sin. See, 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 folks, oh, I committed a little sin. No, he ain't talking about that. He's saying, where's your heart? It's your heart God wants. Because if he got your heart, he can deal with everything else. God, God, God can deal with all the little minor stuff in our life if he has our what? Uh, hearts. But he says, don't suffer for these things. But if you do, let him glory, glorify God. So what he's saying is, if you're going through because you are righteous, you need to be giving God praise. Now, we need to start thanking God. Now, I can embrace that. I'm not going to embrace his judgment because his judgment is not for me. I can embrace his discipline because his discipline is for me. He disciplined those he was. Love. But I'm not going to embrace no punishment that wasn't meant to be for me. I, I just can't do it. So I'm not talking about judgment in that way where, where, where I'm just going to look for judgment. I always want to say, why everybody always tell me God going to judge the, the world? Why they, why they won't look at their own life? How is it Christians can live all kinds of ways? You know, you know, you know they passed the gay marriage and we all got mad. But you know what I asked the church? Why didn't we get mad when that priest came out and he got and, and, and they anointed him as a priest and he was gay and he put in the paper that the Holy Spirit was there with him and he felt the presence of God when, when they was ordaining him as a gay bishop. And the church said nothing. When, when, when it came out that the Catholic priest was doing what they was doing to little boys, the church said nothing. But well, all of a sudden, now the world is doing it, and we get mad. Y'all know God was already mad. God was already upset. See, what we get upset about sometimes, God says, you know what? I, I was upset a long time ago. Because my house would not judge themselves. When the house of God does not judge, y'all, we are the light of the world. And listen, if we don't deal with us, what else do the world have? Y'all, we are the only light that the world has. And if we don't allow the glory of God to shine through the church, what hope is there for the world? This is not the season for us to hide our sins. This is the season that God exposed us. Because I'm ready to demonstrate your glory. I'm ready to show the world how awesome and how great and how wonderful you are. See, when God, when we judge ourselves, guess what? We, we prevent God from judging us. Yeah, the Bible says judge your what? Self. But the church, we won't judge ourselves. We cover everything up. We're afraid to deal with each other. We know people who hate people and don't like people and we won't say nothing to them. We just close our eyes and act like nothing exists and we always love that favorite scripture. For the Bible says you should not judge. And we'd have missed the mark. He ain't even talking about that kind of judgment. He's saying you can't put a judgment on somebody. You can't make a judgment against somebody. But if you really love this person and you see they're about to go off the cliff, you ain't going to grab them and pull them back. You're not going to turn them around. You're not going to say, brother and sister, don't go that way. That's not God. We're we just letting people jump off the cliff. As long as it's not happening to me, I'm okay. 
As long as I'm, I'm righteous, that's okay. But I heard the scripture that there's only one body. We are here for each other. We are here to prevent people. Because this is what it says. Let me read on. It says, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. This is what it says. And if it begins with us, what would be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? And if righteousness is, if the righteous is barely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? He says, hold on. Judgment going to first begin with the household of God. And then people say, no, nah, what is he talking about? But then you know what? Go turn to Revelation. And y'all know where the judge began in Revelation too. Y'all, it did not begin with the world. Where did Jesus first bring his judgment? Y'all, that scripture was fulfilled, and I, st I believe it's going to be fulfilled again. Judgment in Revelation began with the household of God. Jesus came and he addressed the church. We say God don't judge or he don't judge under the New Testament. Well, you know what? We need to go and apologize to Israel because Jesus judged them before he went to the cross. He said unto the disciples came and they said, look at the beauty of this temple. He said, let me tell you, a day is coming that not one stone will be left on another. I think in A.D. 70, the Romans entered Jerusalem. And they destroyed it. And they took it apart stone by stone by stone. And you'll say, O.J., why did it happen? Because they rejected the Son of God. Y'all, during Jeremiah time, they went into captivity for 70 years. Prior to that, they would go in there for 40 years. Do y'all know when they rejected Christ, they almost went in captivity 2,000 years? God drove them out of their homeland. What brings the judgment in is the rejection of Christ. That's what brings the judgment. When it says judgment is going to begin with the household of God, what it's saying is there are those in the household of God who have rejected Christ. They have rejected his goodness. They have rejected his mercy. They have rejected his kindness. See, when he judged the first church of Ephesus in, in the book of Revelation, the second chapter, he came to them and he began to tell them all the good things they had done. And when every time I read that, beyond, it grieves me because I say to myself, Lord, this is the ideal church. These are the ideal Christians. And then Jesus said to them, I see you hate sin, you hate false prophets, you hate this, you do this. He says, but I have one thing against you. Listen to what I'm about to say. The thing that brings on God's judgment more than anything, I believe, is what he brought against the first church. He says, you have rejected your first love. Y'all, Ephesians was the church. They was doing everything in their eyes perfect. Then all of a sudden, John writes a letter and sends the letter and say unto the church of Ephesus, I have been given a revelation from God. All your works don't matter because you have neglected the most important thing, and that's Christ himself. This is what I'm about to say. What will bring the judgment to the household of God is when we reject Christ. It's not about our, we always talk about good works and, and, and we're under grace and we're not under the law. And guess what? We spend all our time and we're not careful working to please him. Why do we talk about law and grace and we don't apply it? Yeah, if we really understood that we are under grace, then you know what? We would stick closer to our first love. Y'all, I'm in a season in my life where my heart beat is, Lord, I have apprehended you to a certain degree, and I want to apprehend you more, and I don't want to lose my relationship with you. If I never prophesy, if I never preach, if I never do nothing for you, God, keep me in your unchanging hand. Keep me close to the fire. Not the fire of the anointing, but the fire of your love, the fire of your goodness, the fire of your mercy, the 
fire of who you are. Keep me, sustain me, withhold me, restrain me if you have to. Put up the roadblocks, do whatever it takes, Lord. But God, I don't want to lose my relationship with you. Because I know a day is coming, oh, that won't matter. I'm learning, Lord, it just don't matter anymore. I told the Lord this. I said, Lord, I got nothing else to lose. What else I have to lose? I wrote it down. I said, Lord, I, I don't want the world because the world has nothing for me. But I kept it real. I said, and Lord, my flesh don't want you. So I need your grace. Because my spirit man is crying out more of you. So you ain't got to fear, 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 fear of judgment when you're in that position. The Ephesus church was judged because at some point they got so caught up in religion. They forgot that Jesus is not a religion. He's a person. And he's coming back for a bride without spot or blemish. He's coming back for what? A bride. He's not coming back for a building. He's not coming back for people who can prophesy. He's not coming back for people who can preach. He's coming back for a bride who have decided in their hearts, Lord, I want you. Don preached on it about being a bond servant. See, a bond servant don't have to worry about the judgment. Because what the bond servant according to Don is, a bond servant is one who volunteers. He's not forced to do nothing. He can really go free if he wants to because he serves his time. But he's, he, he's fallen in love with the master to the degree he says, I don't want to leave you. Pierce my ear that the world may know I have sold out for you. This is my prayer tonight that God will clothe us with his glory that the world may know we have sold out for him. See, then the judgment is not a big deal when we're in that what, position. Another church, he addressed them, and he says, he, he, he says to them, he says, you say you're alive, but you're really dead. You, see, you know what he told you? He said, you better wake up. Let me go back to Ephesus. He, he, what was their judgment? He says, I'm going to come put your light out. Yo, if he put your light out, what do that mean? <laughs> Tell me, that means you're in darkness, right? Yo, that's not good. He said, I'm and like James always say, when you read the first part of for each church, he tells you something about his nature. So in that church, he says, I'm he who walk among the candlesticks. So and, and I got the stars in my hand. So what he's saying, if I put your star out, you're in complete blackness. You tell me that wasn't a judgment? That was him being just some little nice, kind God. But y'all, this is the good news. The warning brings repentance. He said what? Repent. He didn't say become guilty. He didn't say feel condemned. He didn't say feel sorry for yourself. He just said repent. Do you know guilt never produced nothing? I don't know about you, but in my life, I felt sorry for myself when God dealt with me. And the more sorry I felt, the more sin I did. But then I came to a place where I stopped feeling guilty and I said, Lord, I repent. And this is the good news, my sister, when we repent, he don't take us back from the beginning. He restores us right where we are. We move forward. I don't have to go back to the beginning and start over. The moment I repent, his grace comes down, set me free, and I run on with Jesus. Y'all don't know the beauty of, 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 of his warnings about his judgments is to bring the church to repentance so we can experience the fullness of him oh that that i may behold thee that i may apprehend thee that has apprehended me repentance brings us closer to god so when god sends a warning about a judgment it's not for you to go into bondage but it's for you to say in your heart, God, if this offends you, it offends me. And if my dad is offended, I'm offended. And now since I'm offended, I got to do something about it. 
And when you come to that place, you begin to truly experience God. See, read the judgments Jesus had against the church. It wasn't like the world. When he began to judge the church, he always gave them a way of escape. And then he don't stop there. He always tell you the benefits of obeying him. He says, okay, if you don't want to repent just to repent, then let me tell you the benefits of repenting. Now, if he do all that and you still don't repent, you deserve the judgment. See, I'm going to say that. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve your little light to be put out. I, yeah, I'm going to say it. That might sound harsh, but I'm going to say it. Because he tells you to repent. He says, he who overcome, I'm going to make you a pill in the household of God. I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do that for you. And if he tell you all of that just for repenting, and you still say no, tell me what hope? What hope is there for us? What, what hope? No. Yo, and I close with a story. Let me tell you, Ahab was a wicked man. I don't think there was no, no other king as almost wicked outside of Jeroboam. There probably was no other king as wicked as Ahab. And the Bible says Ahab killed the man. Uh, had, uh, had a man, his wife Jezebel had a man killed just because Ahab wanted a piece of land. And God sent the prophet to Ahab. And Elijah said, Ahab, because of the wickedness you have done and because of the evil, God says this is going to happen to you. God says uh, he, he going to kill your children. He going to kill this and he going to kill that. And then all of a sudden, guess what? The Bible says when Ahab heard it, he repented. He put on sackcloth and he began to fast. And y'all want to know the father's response to a wicked man? He said unto Elijah, Elijah, have you not seen Ahab? He repented. What I said going to happen, it won't, it's going to happen, but it won't happen in his lifetime. If God would do that for a wicked man, hear what I'm about to say, how much more will he do for us who are covered and washed in the blood of the Lamb? And that's Old Testament. And we under grace and we under mercy and we under the blood. All he's asking us, don't fear the word judgment because the judgment can only come to those who dwell, abide, live in sin. Have made their home in the abode of sin. But those who recognize sin is not my home. Lord, you're my home. My abode is in the kingdom. My abode is with the Father. What must I do to get it right with you? So that's why I'm not afraid to preach on the judgment. Because it is, it's going to happen. But my job is to warn people. To say this doesn't have to happen to the body of Christ. We can flourish. We can overcome. We can be victorious. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Wow.